So thank you for the opportunity to present to uh, the members of the Institute today. I'm a specialist occupational physician. That's a doctor who does all the normal medical training and then specializes in the Royal Australian College of Physicians with a specialty called occupational and environmental medicine. And that's where we look at the interface of health and work and the interface of health and the environment. I have several consulting entities, but Resile, the one you see on the screen, is the one where I consult to corporations to help maximise the health, well-being, and therefore productivity of their workforce. And I do that by looking at the evidence, looking at the nature of their work, the nature of their workforce, and help them with policies, procedures, and systems to maximise those. Um, but I also do environmental medicine through another consulting entity, and that's where I help either governments or populations or companies look at the impact on the uh, health of a community from the environment. So I'm not interested in the environment. I am, but I'm not in that area of specialty. So whether something's killing fish or trees isn't my gig, but if it's killing people, it is, then it becomes an environmental medicine issue. Sometimes, of course, killing fish and trees does kill humans eventually. So they do, they do run in a continuum. But today I'm talking really in my role as a specialist occupational physician, the interface of health and work. And in doing that role, I'm a medical advisor to various large organizations, um, predominantly those that have a lot of risks, a lot of hazards, or a lot of workers. And so I provide consulting services to lots of mining companies, um, some retail, some health, manufacturing ports, power generation, etc. I have previously, when I owned other entities, which I've subsequently sold, looked after various chemical manufacturing companies to link to you guys, such as uh, I provided assistance to New Newplex, I think, New Farm, and a range of, uh, I think, ACI chemicals, a range of organisations that were manufacturing stuff. And in manufacturing that stuff, there were hazards in the workplace. Uh, and today I've been asked to talk about health surveillance which is a subsection of what we do in occupational medicine. I guess, as in all medicine and healthcare, what we try and do is where we can prevent injury and illness um, before we have to treat it. In prevention, we talk about primary, secondary and tertiary prevention. Um, and health surveillance is part of that either secondary or tertiary prevention. The primary prevention is uh, stopping people getting exposed to something that makes them crook in the first place. Um, but after that, we can then look at secondary and tertiary prevention. The uh, other part of occupational medicine, of course, is treating uh, people with work-related injuries or illnesses. Um, so if somebody's become crook from an exposure to an organophosphate or an isocyanate, if someone's developed a hematological disorder, a cancer, an asthma, or, or other respiratory problems such as coal mine workers' pneumoconiosis, then we get involved in assisting them in the treatment and rehabilitation. Health surveillance, of course, the ambition is to either pick up signs of problems early enough so that they don't get crook, or pick up signs of illness so early that we can stop them becoming significantly impaired or disabled from it. So today we're talking about a very small subsection of what we do, which is to survey the health of the workforce. This is the, I guess, the agenda or the topics we're going to talk about as requested. And um, what do we mean by health surveillance, health surveillance legislation and guidelines, who requires it, what are the responsibilities and who of your organizations are responsible? Uh, how do we determine what we're going to do uh, how do we look at the exposure risks and then how do we manage the results and in the individuals? So we'll stick to that agenda if we can. I'm led to believe I have an hour um, with some question time sort of around that time at the end um, and happy to be interrupted. I must admit my assistant who normally runs all this is away. So if someone tries to put a hand up and I can't see it, I apologize for my ignorance in advance. It is not uh, that I'm ignoring. I may not be even able to see you depending on my screen. Thank you very much. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you. Could you just shut the door, please? Mm -hmm. Cheers. 
Um, so what do we do? What do we survey health for? Well, if you think about your own health and what your doctors are doing for you, hopefully you're seeing a general practitioner, then the point of surveying health and, and certain parameters is to pick something up early enough before it makes you crook. And I guess blood pressure is a really good example. Just because someone's blood pressure is up today, no big deal. Um, it doesn't cause any problems unless it's really, really high and then you can you know, cause problems. But most of the time, if my blood pressure goes up to you know, 100 and 170 over 110, it's not gonna be a big deal. The problem is if it stays up that high, because staying up that high then damages the vessels, the bits behind my eye, bits in my brain and various other things. So we don't want my blood pressure to remain high. Any one elevated level isn't a big deal and sometimes we need to put our blood pressure up if there's a fight or flight requirement. Um, so health surveillance on blood pressure is check my blood pressure every time I see the doc. They're not doing that because they don't know what else to talk about. They're doing it because if we can pick up someone hypertension early, we can stop the chronic disease that comes from it. So surveying the health there is to uh, check for a common medical condition called hypertension. And it's easy to check without hurting anybody. So I don't have to take blood off you. I don't have to put you in a machine. I don't have to do any painful procedure. I just put a little cuff on your arm and measure it. So it's really easy to do, cost effective to do. And if we can pick up hypertension early and stop it, we can stop all sorts of serious disease down the track, which means we'll save a bunch of mortality, morbidity and pain and suffering and, and money, and quite frankly, for the community. So that's a good example of how to survey the health of an individual. Not all things doctors do make common sense. For example, if every time you see a GP, they do a full blood count or a liver function test, that is not a useful screening tool. If they do an ECG every time, that is not a useful screening tool. There's no evidence that it works. There's no evidence that checking your full blood count all the time is going to help you. Um, and that's the really, a really important part about when we start getting into the nitty gritty today about health surveillance. It's got to work. So it's got to be valid. It's got to be sensitive for the illness or disease we're looking for. It's got to be specific so we don't pick up all sorts of things. And um, it's got to be, a, it's cheap, it's minimal impact on the individual, um, and it's got to be able to pick up disease early enough that it'll make a difference. Um, so for example, doing chest x-rays, looking for lung cancer in a general population is of little utility because by the time we find it, it's too big. It's big enough to see on the chest X-ray. It's too big to make a whole lot of difference. That's why we don't send everyone out for chest X-rays all the time, even smokers, even people exposed to lots of asbestos, chest X-rays. The problem with them is by the time we find a mesothelioma on a chest X-ray, you're pretty well buggered. So we need a better screening tool than that, one that will make a difference. Um, for the two perhaps uncomfortable procedures for people, the pap smear for women and the prostate check for men, they are shown to be valid in the right hands uh, because if we pick up uh, a changing cells um, on, the, on the uterus early enough, on the cervix early enough, uh, it makes a big difference. If we can feel a bump on a prostate early enough, it makes a big difference. There are a lot of other things we do in medicine that doesn't necessarily make a difference, such as whole body MRIs will make no difference to your long-term uh, outcome. In occupational medicine, health surveillance, as you can see on the screen, is defined by various entities. But Safe Work Australia is, uh, defines it pretty well. We're ensuring that control measures are effective when we exposing people to hazards in the workplace and it provides an opportunity to reinforce specific preventative measures and safe work practices. Given your chemists, we're going to sort of talk about hazardous chemicals, um, which make up the majority of the useful health surveillance. Obviously we're exposed to hundreds and hundreds of chemicals every day. I always tell workers 3,000 a day, that's probably an exaggeration, but probably not by the time you count every single inert object sitting around us. And I say, you're probably exposed to scores of hazardous chemicals every day, but in such a dose, it's unlikely to be causing you a health concern. However, there are some hazardous chemicals in workplaces that we know if people are exposed to them at high enough dose over long enough time, it can make them unwell. 
and uh, those are the ones we want to know about. Just because there is a hazardous chemical, though, doesn't mean there's any valid method of surveying the health of the workforce. Besides chemicals, we do health surveillance on a whole bunch of other hazards. For example, if there's psychosocial hazards in the workplace, if you're doing a lot of shift work, if you're exposed to the human population, which is a hazard, um, if you've got other stressors, we can do surveillance of your psychosocial well-being, and they're valid tools to check to see how you're going. If you're exposed to certain physical hazards, such as noise, we can monitor uh, your hearing. Um, and very early on, we can detect even minor changes in the hearing, which tells us that you might be exposed to too much noise, which means we go in and have a look at, well, what are the safety systems in place so that you're not exposed to too much noise? Because we know noise is a hazard. We know, it'll, we know it will cause hearing loss in some people. If we start to pick up early changes of hearing loss, we've got to go in and say, well, who's doing what to prevent this? And we have in occupational medicine this thing called a hierarchy of control. And that's where we try and control hazards in the work environment um, by, first of all, identifying the hazards, such as noise, and then looking at how we can manage it. And it's a hierarchy because there's obviously really good ways to manage it. For example, if we can eliminate noise, then you don't have to worry about it. We can't eliminate it, we might be able to substitute it. This is important in chemicals, because for a while we used really hazardous chemicals to do stuff. And one of your colleagues I was just talking to about, his job is to help see what chemicals we can bring into the Australian community. There are some chemicals that work really, really well, but uh, when we look at them, they cause such hazards to the health of workers in the community that they just weren't worth it and we should substitute them and uh, benzene might be an example of that, where there might be other solvents or chemicals that can do the job. Obviously, we found lots of other things besides asbestos to utilise in um, manufacturing and industry. Um, so sometimes we just want to eliminate things altogether. That's particularly so with the carcinogens. But we can't always eliminate them altogether. We can't eliminate silica altogether. We can't eliminate certain other hazards like noise. Um, it's nearly impossible. Noise is a byproduct of energy and real nearly impossible to get rid of hazardous noise. So if we can't eliminate it, we can't substitute it. You can't really substitute noise for anything. Although you can change the, um, uh, the equation so that the excess energy can come out in some other way besides sound. Um, and if we can't uh, substitute it, then we've got to start applying engineering techniques. That is, can we can we build stuff around it to block the chemical or to stop the asbestos getting out or to block the noise from getting out? Can we, uh, can we um, do things from a, I guess, a, a people management point of view? Can we remove people from the noise or from the chemical? Can we rotate the shifts? Can we do all of those things? And then the final stage of it is PPE. That is, if we can't remove people, can we give them something to protect them from the hazard? And PPE would include a big hat if you're out in the sun, the known carcinogen cause, cause UV radiation. Um, can we get people to wear respiratory PPE so they can still work in the coal mine even though there's coal dust everywhere? Can we put earplugs in people? Can we give people certain PPE, respiratory PPE to block isocyanates or to block other hazardous chemicals? So the health surveillance then is after you've assessed where the hazard is in the workplace, in your case, the chemical, um, and can we not eliminate it or get rid of it or engineer it out if we can't? Well, we still got to put people PPE. And then if there is a valid method of surveying the health of the worker, um, then you should implement it. Um, should's an operative word here because under our workplace health and safety legislation, we live under a Robin style workplace health and safety legislation. Robins was a bloke in the UK, a Lord, uh, ex good labor man who uh, was the head of the coal mines there, ended up with a bad reputation. The unions didn't like him in the end and he oversaw a terrible tragedy, probably not his fault, but left him a legacy. But he was asked to look at the workplace health and safety legislation and realized it was unworkable because they tried to give solutions to everybody to say, uh, don't let anybody lift this much and don't let anybody be exposed to this chemical beyond this level and don't let anyone do, be exposed to this noise. But it, your, your legislation becomes massive because there's so many things that are hazards in a workplace. 
He said, it's not working. Everyone's ignoring it because it's too big, can't be enforced. He came up with what was ultimately called Robin style, which means the company's job is to find hazards by looking properly and carefully through an appropriate expert, assess the risk to the health of the workforce, and then manage that risk. And that's kind of the workplace health and safety legislation. It could be a one little flyer. Then we add in a whole bunch of other stuff. But by and large, that's a Robin style legislation. So any health hazard in the workplace, a company, uh, or it's really a person running the company, um, is responsible to make sure that people don't get crook from the workplace. And that can be because they're living, lifting things, ergonomic problems, chemical exposure, psychosocial hazards, physical hazards, etc. One of those hazards might be chemicals. And for some of them, part of the requirement would be health surveillance. Although it was Robin style, we went in and added a few things to it and said, you know what, we really need to do certain specific things. And that's where health surveillance came in. For some chemicals, particularly the really nasty ones and the carcinogens, etc., where we have a valid method of health surveillance, we should compel companies to do it. You still don't have to do it in a lot of states, but it's put in what would be called a code of practice, which means if you don't do it and someone gets crook, you will be held liable because you didn't do it. You can use another method, but if someone becomes crook and you didn't follow that code of practice, you're on a hiding to nothing. And with industrial manslaughter laws in several states now, that's a big deal. Because if someone dies from an exposure to a hazard or a chemical for which there were valid methods of risk management, including health surveillance, and you as a director or a manager or an advisor didn't do anything about it, you might find you're not just in breach of the Workplace Health and Safety Act, but if your negligence reaches the level of criminal negligence, you can and will be found guilty of industrial manslaughter. And there are people in jail right now in Queensland for that very reason. They didn't manage a hazard properly enough. They either knew about it and ignored it or should have known about it and didn't look carefully enough. So the obligations to do health surveillance have getting uh, more and more onerous. There's only so many chemicals for which there is a valid method or hazardous substances for which there is a valid method of health surveillance. There's a document that Safe Work Australia, that's the governing body across the Commonwealth, puts out called Managing Risk of Hazardous Chemicals in the Workplace. It's a code of practice. Remember I said the code of practice is something you've got to follow or do just as good as, and you'll be held to the account of the exact document unless you can prove you did something better, which is really, really hard. So part of that talks about Schedule 3, hazardous substances for which health surveillance is required. There are other hazardous substances where there's probably some good valid health surveillance um, and that can be done, but these ones you have to do if you're exposing your workers to them to the point where it could cause disease. There are thousands of other chemicals or hazardous substances out there for which there is no health surveillance not because someone hasn't been able to make a fancy test, you can always make a test for something, but because there's no evidence that it makes a difference to look for it. Therefore, we don't implement it. If this health surveillance isn't specific and sensitive and cheap and easy to implement and painless for the worker and can pick up a disease early enough that we can actually make a difference, if it doesn't meet all those criteria, it won't be deemed a valid method of health surveillance and we won't implement it. So obviously some of these aren't chemicals, they're dusts, but you get the picture that a lot of these are chemicals of which you would uh, be well aware, some of you, um, and you get the picture that these uh, are a very small number of chemicals or hazardous substances, compounds, uh, and, but they're really important ones because we know they cause significant disease when exposed over time and dose. And we know we have methodologies of managing the hazard uh, there. I've been involved in pretty well all of them. And I've got some tricky cases going on at the moment with cadmium, chromium, asbestos, arsenic, lead, isocyanates, mercury, organophosphates I haven't done for a while because I've sold that entity, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, silica, and what have you. Um, the tech, special techniques or math, methods 
for which we apply health surveillance don't uh, really matter. But needless to say, it depends on the hazardous substance as to what test would be valid. So for example, with uh, chromium, uh, there's different types of chromium. There's trivalent and hexavalent. They can cause skin problems and kidney problems and gut problems and mucosal problems and are carcinogenic um, in high enough dose. Um, but those ones, our best methodology is urine. We could do blood, we could do other methods, but urine's the one we understand the best and it's the one we can make the best correlation between exposure and disease. For silica, the most accurate measure is a good chest X-ray or high resolution CT scan of the lungs. Because if we pick it up early enough in the lungs, we can stop lung disease, but also silica is really interesting because it doesn't just cause lung disease, it can cause uh, systemic disease, including increased incidence of rheumatoid. Um, so we've got to pick it up early. I'm sure everyone's aware of the silica crisis that we're going through at the moment. We, we know it's in coal mines and we know it's in construction, but the big deal of late has been these synthetic or, or manufactured bench tops. So back in the day, the only people who could afford stone bench tops were the really, really rich because stone was expensive, uh, particularly marble and what have you. Someone have to cut it, shape and put it in there. So the rest of us did what I grew up with, which was chipboard with, with um, vinyl over the top. Um, but now all of us can afford stone bench tops because of this uh, manufactured stone that we, now every house we ever go to has got it. Unfortunately, we dropped the ball on regulating this and the workers with it had massive doses of silica. And we now have people who have already died, are dying, and people on the lung transplant list who may not make it because of massive doses of silica. There have been lots of people who have become very unwell from the other chemicals or hazardous substances on that list you see in front of you. Australia's made a lot of money out of lead. We got big lead mines, big industries that use lead, but the price we've paid is we've exposed a lot of workers and unfortunately also children in the community to levels of lead that we know cause disease. For lead, we have a really good method of measuring called blood lead. Unfortunately, the side effect is we've got to stick a needle in someone's arm, but by and large, that's uh, when in good hands, doesn't cause much harm to anybody. They may not like it, the needle, but, and it gives a really good measurement, an accurate measurement, and then we can manage it according to how high the level is. That helps us make workplace decisions on whether or not there's appropriate safety systems in the workplace to stop people getting exposed to inorganic lead, but also on an individual level, I can manage the individual if I know their lead level. With regards to the community, we don't want even low levels in our young kids because it uh, has an impact on their neural development. And so we want to monitor that closely in people who are living around lead towns like Mount Isa or Port Puri or in the Tasmanian community I've been doing tests on because they're right near a lead and zinc mine. Um, and we're looking at the soil, the plants, etc. So certain chemicals, certain hazardous substances, we know that health surveillance works, but it's only certain ones. So who has to do this? Well, predominantly the employer's got it. And therein lies the problem with small employers because they may not even be aware of it. They may not know the hazards, etc. Large employers usually can afford consultants like myself or fancy workplace health and safety officers who will help them understand the hazards to which their workers are exposed and what health surveillance is a useful, valid tool. Um, doing some form of health surveillance where it's not a valid tool ends up doing more harm than good. A good example I like to give people is MRI scans of the whole body. That seems counterintuitive because you're often told if only we got the cancer early enough and MRI is really good at picking up cancers early because we find tiny little spots. Surely it makes sense. Why don't I just get an MRI every year? MRI my brain, MRI my bowel, MRI my lungs, MRI everything, and see if I've got a tumor. Because I'm gonna pick it up early. And that makes a bit of sense. The problem is we end up killing more people than we save because it's not specific. It's sensitive, it'll pick stuff up, but it's not specific. That is, it'll pick up lots of other things besides cancer. And once we find that little spot, 
we then got to do something because we found it. And you're going to say, well, you found it. Now what are you going to do? We're going to, well, we've got to do something. So we start going to try and look for it or take it out or sample it. And that's when we start biopsying or cutting out things. And uh, biopsies, say for the lungs, have significant mortality rate in certain people. So we end up, and then we get the biopsy out, the person gets really crook from the biopsy, and the biopsy gets put under a microscope and there's nothing there. It's just looked like a cancer, but it's not. So we end up killing more people with the follow-up tests than we saved by picking up the tumors early. So that's an example of where it seems so obvious in logic, if we pick up cancers early enough, we can save people's lives. MRIs pick up cancers early, ergo, why don't we do MRIs on everyone? And yet it's just not true. It's a fallacy of logic because we didn't take into consideration the lack of specificity uh, of the, it's very sensitive, but it's not specific, and the side effects of what to do with it. Um, health surveillance is the same. So the employer's got to make sure who should be health surveyed under what government. They've got to pay for it. They've got to implement it. They've got to manage it. And they've got to make sure they protect workers from things like privacy, confidentiality, etc., cetera, um, and anti-discrimination. The medical practitioner, me, um, I've got to give the expert advice on what health surveillance is needed for what chemicals or hazardous substances. Um, how should we plan it and implement it? How frequently should we do the test? Should we do that before they start? How frequently once they start? Do we need to do it after they've left the workplace? What kind of medical records do we keep to ensure confidentiality? Um, how long do I keep them for? I've got obligations to keep them for 30 years, for example, with all those hazardous substances we've just looked at. How do I communicate to the workers and to the employer? How do I communicate to government? Because some of those chemicals we looked at are hazardous substances. If you get crook from those, it's called a notifiable disease. That is the government demands they be informed if someone has it. So for example, now silicosis is one of those. If I find silicosis on you, I've got to tell the government I found it. Even if you said, oh, don't tell them. I don't want you to tell them. I, need, I want to keep it a secret. I don't want to lose my job. I don't get that luxury. I must tell them. Other ones on that list are not uh, notifiable diseases, and you don't have to. Uh, but most of them are notifiable diseases. Uh, my job is to communicate well to the employee um, and to the about the nature of the problem and the employer about how to better control their risk. I'm not treating the employee. In doing health surveillance, we haven't entered into a doctor-patient relationship, um, technically, or a treating doctor-patient relationship. They're not my patient. They're an examinee. They're a person I'm checking on this. If they get crook, I then hand them back in most circumstances to their general practitioner. But often I'll be asked to have me or one of my doctors help manage the condition as well because it's our area of expertise. Employee have to participate in the health surveillance program. It's a reasonable directive under the Workplace Health and Safety Act, which means they don't get to opt out of it. They can refuse to participate, of course, because at the end of the day, I have an autonomous body. I can say, no, you're not taking a blood sample. No, you're not x-raying me. We can't hold them down and force the sample out of them. Um, it's pretty hard forcing urine out of someone. But what you can do is say, well, to work in this workplace, you're exposed to that hazard and under the workplace health and safety legislation you must participate in the health surveillance program to not participate in the health surveillance program means you're you are no longer able to meet your obligations under the workplace health and safety act i as a person conducting a business are no longer allowed to meet my obligations therefore we have to terminate the employment agreement and people are allowed to be terminated on the grounds that they don't want to participate in health surveillance you don't get the luxury if they've got a good reason why the health surveillance will cause them harm, that's okay. We will then look at other ways. They've got to have a good reason. They can't just say, well, I don't like giving blood or I don't like peeing in a cup or I don't want to get a chest x-ray. Um, they have to have a really good reason why they can't. And then I can come up with other methods, if available, to provide health surveillance and risk management for not just the individual, but for their employer. So you can see we all have obligations. Um, some of you on this meeting, maybe employees, you have obligations as an employee. Some of you may be in management, you have obligations as an officer of the company to meet these. 
and some of you may be the employer or person conducting the business, you have increased obligations, but you will almost certainly have obligations in some component of this um, if you're exposed to hazards in the workplace, subsection hazardous chemicals, or sorry, uh, hazardous chemicals, um, and sub subsection those that for which there's a useful and beneficial uh, health surveillance tool. So who are you gonna to use to do this? Look, in most states, it just says use a doctor. Um, but then they add on a little bit, it says, and they must be familiar with the substances and the job tasks uh, of those who work with the substances and the workplace to assist in planning and implementation of program of health surveillance. There's only so many doctors who have got that experience, familiarity, who have had that training, and quite frankly, who are interested in doing it, because it's a tough gig. It's easy being a doctor where all you've got to worry about is your patient. No third parties, not allowed to talk to their family members, confidentially only won't allow it. Don't have to go talking to some other parties. You're just dealing with you and the patient. It's a really focused responsibility. Occupational medicine isn't quite like that. I have multiple stakeholders in my medical practice. The person, the patient, the worker, uh, the employer who I have obligations to, the union I usually will interact with, sometimes in a fruitful, friendly manner, sometimes in less fruitful, less friendly manner. Um, I have obligations to the departments of workplace health and safety, to lawyers, to insurers, and trust me, all of them come and talk to me all the time at any time and ask for stuff. So sometimes I miss the days where it's just me and a patient, me and one other person. Don't have to worry about anyone else, can be rude to everyone else, say, no, I'm not gonna to talk to you, no, you're not coming in. I don't get that luxury. And so you'll find less and less medical practitioners wanna do this, and even less of those are actually good at it. How do you find the ones? Well, the best place to go is the area of specialty, which is the, go to the Royal Australian College of Physicians and seek out the um, members of the Faculty of Occupational Medicine. Um, who happen to be environmental physicians as well, or AFOM. So doctors who specialize in that interface of health and work. They are all well-trained to uh, specialty college level. Well, first of all, we have to all do postgraduate or masters in occupational health. Then we have to do certain theses and write research. Then we have to sit um, a lot of exams. And after four or five years, if, our, if we pass to the, um, to the uh, acceptance of our of the college and our fellows, then you get accepted. So it's reasonably onerous, and I think most organisations are well advised to seek them out. In the good old days, um, anyone could deliver a baby. It could be a GP, it could be anyone, my neighbour. But now, if in Brisbane a GP started to deliver babies again, they'd be putting themselves at risk. And the reason is because if something goes wrong, and it will eventually, it's a tough gig sometimes, if something goes wrong and that person is hauled into a coroner's court or an investigative inquiry, they'll have a whole bunch of people stand up against them, their own colleagues say, he or she shouldn't have been delivering that baby. There is an obstetrician just over there, a specialist, that's all they do all day long, just over there, they should have been doing it. It wasn't like it was difficult to access the person. It wasn't like the, per the patient couldn't have seen them. So when someone oversteps their bounds of training and expertise, it's all fine unless something goes wrong. And I think that's the case here. It's okay for someone to say, I think I know how to do this properly. I'm gonna go and do it. Um, but if something goes wrong and there's not physician just around the road, it might be a bit of a struggle. Don't get me wrong. There are some general practitioners out there who are better at this than some of my opposition colleagues. There's also general practitioners out there who can deliver a better baby than some of my obstetrician colleagues until something goes really wrong. And that's when we reach the limit of their capabilities. So while the legislation says it can be any medical practitioner who's familiar with what's on the left-hand side there, the easiest way to get standardized quality is to uh, go to the faculty or the college where this expertise lies. It will give you much better uh, much more reassurance and better medical legal coverage so could something go wrong. 
it's better to um, uh, recommend to your client or your employer to use such a specialist from a risk mitigation point of view. More and more boards want to know they're mitigating their risk. Executives want to know. Officers of the company need to know, are we doing the best to mitigate the risk? And if you want to do that when it comes to managing the health of your workforce and mitigating poor health outcomes due to hazardous substances or chemicals, using a specialist occupational physician is the key. So the process you follow is, you first of all got to wander around your workplace, understand quite well, not just what you're using in the process, but what the byproducts are and the end product. And then walk around and say, right, well, what are the, in this case, we're looking at health surveillance of hazardous substances. What substances have we got here in the workplace? It is actually a more onerous task than you think. A lot of people think they know the chemicals in their workplace or the hazardous substances, but they often miss a lot of it. That stuff sitting in the toilet just across the hall from me, that's a hazardous substance. There's bleach in there and bleach is a hazardous substance. It's not one for which we've got health surveillance, but you need to be across all of the substances in your workplace. And then you have to know which ones are hazardous to health. That's a good walkthrough audit of someone who's trained to spot these things, can quickly pick up, give you a list at the end and say, there you go. There's all your hazardous substances in this workplace. You better do something to manage it. As I said, you can then have a look to see if it's going to do harm. Just having a hazardous substance in the workplace doesn't mean it's going to do harm. For example, I've got sitting on my desk a chunk of lead on one side, I should have brought it up actually, and sitting over here a big chunk of asbestos containing rock. Neither are making me crook or anyone else here crook. Because the lead's in a format that it's just, unless I try and melt it um, or grind it all up, it's not gonna cause anyone health effect. The asbestos in that rock is sealed off in the front with a lacquer, it's not gonna get into the air. So while I've got hazardous substances, there they are right there. They're not injurious to people's health because it won't get into their body in the normal circumstances. I may regret it one day if we have a high energy fire and the lead melts, but I suspect I've got other things to worry about if I get to a fire that has enough temperature to melt lead. So you've got to not just find out well, what are your hazardous substances, but are they likely to cause health problems? The way to do that is you've got to know, well, how are people exposed to it? Is it through the lungs, through the skin? Do they eat it? Um, does it get it through the eyes? Um, and under what circumstances will it get in there? And that means you've got to, and it doesn't just have to get in there. It doesn't matter if I get a tiny bit of lead in my system. It matters if I get a lot over a long time. So you've got to work out, well, how's it going to get in there? And then you've got to do some measuring. So if it's airborne hazard, then you do airborne monitoring. And you check to see what levels people are likely to be exposed at. So if I, this uh, workplace where I was at last week who had hexavalent chromium, they found it because they saw the yellow substance, they tested it, it's hexavalent chromium, they were working around it. But when we did the actual measurements in the air, it wasn't getting into the air, which is the principal methodology of absorption. They could have been eating it, you can absorb it, but it's very low risk. And it could have gone through their skin, but that's also lower risk. And when we measure the air, we can say, well, look, yes, you've got the hazardous substance, it's a carcinogen, it's a problem, but there's not much in the air here. Therefore, we don't think it's gonna make a risk to your workforce. So do what you need to do, get rid of it, stop your workers getting exposed, but we don't think it's a risk. In that case, we did a cross section of the workforce and I checked their urine to see how much uh, chromium they had in their urine and the levels were of such low level that I said, no, there's no risk to this workforce this point in time from that hazardous exposure at that single point in time, health surveillance is of no benefit. Um, you don't have to have zero in your urine. Chromium is an essential um, element for the human body. We need it for certain proteins. Um, you just need to not be above a certain level. Now me saying that caused some problems because some of the union saying, well, how can he say that? I can see the bloody chromium. There it is right there. And we were grinding near that. We know it was getting in the eggs, we saw it. How could that doc say our health isn't at risk and we don't need health surveillance? And so I have to talk them through that health surveillance is only of use if your exposure is to the point where it's likely to have been absorbed and cause disease. 
And when we tested 40 people, no one had elevated, well, that's not true, one had elevated chromium in their urine. 39 or 43 out of 44 did not have it. Um, and the levels we found in the egg matched that it was unlikely to cause that. Once you do that then, you've got to work out, well, are there any health surveillance techniques available for the substance? We, we've already talked about that. You've got to have a method. Can you do a blood test, a urine test, uh, a hair sample, a chest x-ray? Is there something we can do, a breath test? Some things have good tests such as bone biopsy, but as you can imagine, it's not necessarily um, a, a test that people are going to want to have. You then got to work out, is, if there, even if there is a way to survey the health, would it be beneficial for those at risk? And we've already talked about that, that carrying on with chest x-rays in asbestos exposure won't be necessarily beneficial to the health. We might find something like pleural plaques or something, but it's not necessarily beneficial to their health. Therefore, you shouldn't just willy-nilly go around doing chest x-rays because chest x-rays have side effects. One is we're exposing people to radiation um, and, uh, and that's in carcinogen in itself although they're quite safe nowadays. We've got the dose the millisieverts right down. And, uh, but the other thing is we're gonna find stuff and then we won't have to do with the stuff we find. So are the methods of health science like to be acceptable to those at risk? I suspect bone biopsy is unlikely to be acceptable. Peeing in a cup for most people is an acceptable methodology. Um, and are they practical and ethically acceptable? Once we work that out, we can then proceed. How do we assess the exposure risk? Well. The method we recommend is a joint program. The occupational hygienist uses science and technology to measure the exposures. And from that, the occupational physician then gets involved to look at that exposure, work out what's the likely impact on human health, and then see if there's a methodology of health surveillance. If there is, then we'll design and implement a health surveillance program. Once it's implemented, our job is then to manage that program, oversee it, and deal with the positives and the negatives and the false positives and then what follow-up tests are required. A lot of the tests we do are screening tests and they really tell us we should go on and do other tests. So if I find elevated uh, lead, for example, that's a screening test and if it's only to a certain level, let's say I'll remove them from the lead risk job, which is what we call it, a cadmium risk job, a chromium risk job, a lead risk job, remove them from it, follow up in six weeks, depending on the half-life of the chemical, lead's a half-life of about six weeks, and see how low they've come down. If they come back down to low, all happy. If their level, however, is quite high, I've got to check to see if they've been made crook. It's just telling me they've got lead in their blood. That's not good enough. I need to check to see if there's crook. And so there's other tests I can do then to see if it's damaging the cells, see if there's increased risk of other diseases from that lead exposure. So if the level is high enough, I then do other stuff. A, a chest X-ray is often a screening test to then do further investigations like a high resolution CT scan. Um, uh, screening audiometry to see if someone's had a threshold shift or a hearing loss may just be a screening test to go on to more formal audiometric testing. Managing the results is a big deal. Um, so a lot of what it is is about communicating to the employee. So we need individual result letters. The employees, although lots of them, just get them, throw them in the bin. They're not interested. It's really important that for those who are interested, they get all of the communication they need to help be cognizant and even manage their own health risks in the workplace. The employer has to be informed as soon as reasonably practical because they've got to investigate um, to see, well, we've got an elevated lead. What's going wrong? In this battery factory, we normally manage our lead. We're working with lead all the time, but not that many people have been elevated before. Why is this person elevated? And it could be that something's failed in the system or it could be that that person is not following the health requirements. And with lead, for example, most of our lead exposure, I talked about fumes, but most lead exposure in places like the batteries, they, we eat it. We touch the surface, the fume gets in our nose, and then we swallow it and we absorb it through our gut. And so the people who tend to eat lead when they shouldn't are the people who aren't staying hygienic, the people who aren't washing their hands before they eat, wash their hands before they smoke. Because obviously smoke, you've got to touch your lips all the time, you've got lead on your fingers, 
you put it on your lips, you get it on your lips, you lick it, you lick your lips, you eat it. So we check to see is the individual contributing to their increased level in health surveillance or, or is the workplace not doing something to mitigate that risk. From there, then the employer can do something um, and the employee can be managed. Uh, I have to, because a lot of these substances for which we have health surveillance are carcinogens, I must follow this up for a long time. Because a lot of the diseases we are trying to manage happen over a long term. There are a lot of things that short term will kill you, carbon monoxide, uh, but we can't monitor it in the long term. There are other things that don't harm you in the short term, but in the long term they can. And obviously carcinogens are like that. For cancers to form, it has to be many years after the initial hazardous exposure occurred. For example, I started to have some skin cancers, as you can see in my fair skin, cut out when I was 30. And much to my mum's disgust when I say it, that happened in my childhood. Those cancers are not because I got sunburned last week, last month, last year, or even last decade. It takes a lot longer than that for cancer to form because it's got to damage the DNA first from the exposure, whether that's exposure to a, a chemical that's a carcinogen or a solar radiation or tobacco. Um, that's then got to damage DNA. It's got to overwhelm the considerable defense mechanisms our body has to kill cancer. We've got all these cancer killing cells going around attacking every little morph that occurs in a cell. It's got to overwhelm those and then it's got to grow. And remember one little cell, tiny little cell morphs for it to get to a size that's going to cause any problems, it's there for a long time. Because it's going from one cell to two cell takes time, two cells to four cells. To get to any size that would even possibly find it, you're taking a long time, many years. To get to a size where it's likely to have spread, you're looking at years to decades. And therein lies the problem with cancer. By the time we find it, it's often of such a size that it's spread because you don't find cancers early because they've got to get it a considerable size and that takes many, many years to grow. And depending where the cancer is, you may never find it. There are some parts of the body where luckily we find the cancer early because it causes pain early on or discomfort or a problem. There are other cancers such as those, in the tail of the pancreas, we don't find until it's way, way too late. Hence it's poor outcome in the long term. Bowel cancers, obviously you don't find till you notice blood in your bowel or until someone does a colonoscopy. If you get it early enough, it does well. So I have an obligation to keep these records for at least 30 years, because often that's when we start to find the cancers, not before that. So this is my little pithy saying to remind people, I always talk about the hazards in workplaces and you know, we've got to look after the health of workers and be careful, but be under no illusion, the greatest risk to our health long-term is not working because health, particularly, uh, sorry, work, particularly healthy work, has great benefits to our biopsychosocial well-being. It keeps us healthy, it keeps us happy, it provides all sorts of intangible benefits, and it uh, helps keeps us rich. And money often has a lot to do with then your long-term health outcomes and your children's health outcomes. So this is an overview of uh, the, why do we do health surveillance, when do we have to do it? When might we want to do it? When does it work and when does it not work? Against what substances or exposures? Is there evidence it works? Which ones in most states of Australia do we have to do health surveillance on? If we're going to do it, what's the best way to do it? What experts do we need to use? What are we going to do with the information? And uh, how do we carefully manage the workers who we're asking to be exposed to these hazards. Sometimes these hazards can't be removed. Sometimes they provide enormous benefits to the community. Um, and therefore we do need people to dig it out of the ground or be exposed to it or work in an environment around it because it does such wonders for the community um, that we must keep working with these hazards such as going outside into the sun or uh, being around silica or coal dust. Um, but we have an obligation, legal, moral, and ethical, to look after the health of that workforce. And anyone conducting the business or being an officer of that business has a legal obligation to do it properly. And the responsibilities and the penalties, if you don't, can be quite considerable.
So that's the, the presentation. Um, it doesn't go into great detail about any one hazardous substance. Of course, there's so many of them. Uh, it doesn't talk about what to do specifically, um, but an overview of at least what approach to take. I don't know if anyone has any questions, and I probably know even less about if you're going to ask a question, how I'm going to see it. But uh, happy to take a question if they can get it through to me. Thank you, Rob. We certainly do have a question. I will unmute Julia and... Um, um, and let Julia... Um, great presentation, very informative. I was wondering, at what stage do you have to communicate to the regulator that someone's results indicated that there was chemical exposure? Uh, there are set rules on different uh, hazardous substances and different diseases. So in some substances or hazards, as soon as you exceed the predetermined safe level, OEL, occupational exposure limit, if you exceed that for some of those, you've got to inform the Department of Workplace Health and Safety in your state. No one had to have been made crook. Might not even be any evidence that anyone got absorbed into their body, but just by exceeding it, you've got to notify. There are others where if someone has a sign through your health surveillance of an exposure, you've got to declare that. So for example, with lead, it's okay to have a lead level above here and then here and then here but at this point we have to notify the government they need to be informed it's usually done by the pathology company because they're the first ones to see it so it varies from substance to substance government state to state but um, for some such as for example if you're measuring the environment for the organisms that cause legionnaires disease as soon as you have a level above here you've got to report it even if no one's been made crook for others you only report when someone's been made crook and each one varies. Thank you. I'm going to ask you a question, Rob. Um, thallium, can you tell me what's involved in thallium testing in the levels? Thallium? Yeah. Yeah, so thallium is one of the metals that uh, can have an impact on uh, the health of workers. Mm -hmm. We don't see a lot of it uh, as much as we used to now. And, um, and so I'm not doing any health surveillance on thallium, but my recollection is it can cause damage to various organs of the body, including the lungs and the nervous system. And the methodology is urinary, I believe. But it's uh, not one that I'm regularly measuring at the moment. And so I'll be going to the uh, documents in Safe Work Australia and basically following those um, precisely. We do see it in various industries still and in the military in an aerospace industry, I'm seeing it. Um, and uh, we use thallium in a lot of places where it's not hazard because it's such low dose. Um, but we're not, I'm not monitoring anyone with thallium exposure at the moment. Yeah, I only ask because I, I used to work with thallium for a few years um, in my younger days and I didn't have any well, probably not enough to have much exposure, but... Um, Where we, what industry was it? You know, I was doing my PhD research and I was using a lot of thallium to make up some solutions. Yeah, well, to, depending on the measurements, you probably should have been <laughs> monitoring. But, it, you know, we, there's lots of people exposed to lots of hazardous substances where they could be getting health surveillance or they're not. And a lot of that's got to do with small industry, self-employed, small employers. Um, we just don't have a sight over those industries. Um, so we can't uh, get at them. And certainly, you know, working at my dad's produce store, <coughs> the chemical pesticides were kept in glass bottles back in the day. And uh, in his wisdom, he'd have them on shelves down low and we'd have trolleys moving around bags of things. And if I ever, which was not uncommon, bump things and smashed a bottle, I had to clean it up, of course. And he'd often throw me a Hessian bag and I'd have to get down on my hands and knees and wipe up all the 245T and DDT and anything else we spell and all the organophosphates, I'm just wiping them up. And I distinctly remember getting quite woozy at times. And get, oh, really. But uh, health and safety has come a long way. Um, in the I way guess my exposure was back in the 1980s, so... Um 
it's probably long gone out of my system anyway. So yes, most of uh, the most of them have a reasonably short. Some of the half lives are six months for some of the substances. Um, things like lead, the half life in the blood is, but it goes into the bones. So it just absorbs into the bones. A lot of the organophosphates go into the fat tissue of the you know the body and the bum, and they're always there. A lot of people say, oh, therefore we're accumulating. There's no evidence that it accumulates in a hazardous way. Just because we've got organophosphates in our fat tissue of my bum, who cares? It's just sitting there, it's not causing any harm. Same with bones and lead. Lead gets into the bones, the, this calcium substrate of the bone. It's not a problem. Except when I get older and my bone starts leaching and getting osteoporotic, or when I have a big fracture. So every now and then you see someone who, uh, it's motor vehicle accident. They've been working in lead all their life and they fracture lots of bones. And then all of a sudden, halfway through their rehabilitation, they get suddenly really, well, halfway through our assessment, they get really sick. And we suddenly realize they've got lead poisoning because a whole bunch of broken bones have leached lead back into the system. Um, have you had anything to do with PFAS? PFAS, yes. Yeah, we have quite a bit to do with it, as you can imagine. It's a bit of a hot topic. Um, Somewhat controversial because the research shows us it's not as bad as a lot of people would say. Um, but there are a lot of farmers out there who would who uh, say, well, it doesn't matter almost because my land's become valueless because the whole world doesn't want anything to do with it. But we've done a lot of research on it and there doesn't appear to be a lot of evidence that it's as dangerous as people say. It may well increase the risk of certain cancers, but only to a slight degree. Um, but it is detrimental to the environment. And it's one of those things that have now got a life of its own. Um, and there's, you know, as you know, around Darwin, um, down in Williamtown and uh, around Dolby is it um, where the military bases are, they're all getting blamed, but there's a lot of industries that use this stuff. The Brisbane airport's got it. I look after some ports that have got heaps of it. Anywhere there was lots of firefighting equipment, there was PFOS. And so it's uh, all over the place. I don't overly worry about it um, from a health point of view. For an individual, I can reassure them there's not a lot of evidence, but it is one of those persistent pollutants that needs to be sorted out. We, there's no measures for it though. If you came and said, I think I've been exposed, I wouldn't be doing any particular tests on it. I do have one more question, but if anyone else has one, I'd let them. I was just gonna talk about glyphosate and Roundup and what's your opinion on, on that one? Well, my opinion is someone got $246 million for it, didn't they? Yeah. Was it half a billion? I can't remember. It was a lot of money. Uh, yeah, well, it was the great saviour, wasn't it? It was a really, really effective herbicide that it purportedly could drink. Um, it was that safe um, compared to all the other ones, uh, compared to the um, herbicides that preceded it. Um, and, and I, we seem to have minimal concern about it and people were using it. Kids were using it. Your pets could be around it. Everyone used it in their household. PPE was hardly ever required. And we've been using it in spades all around the country. There's now some evidence that it does increase your risk of certain hematological problems. I've done some health surveillance on people who have been working with it for 30 years. I've yet to find anyone who's shown any disease. Just because someone in the States says it's a problem, there's lots of things that happen in the States that aren't necessarily scientific or evidence-based, but it has been deemed now a carcinogen, um, I think a class two, two A carcinogen by IARC, not, a, not accepted in Australia yet. So um, I think that uh, it's possible that we underestimated some of the detrimental effects of it. Um, but what I do know is uh, weedicides like that have saved so many lives by making food a lot cheaper and easier to, for very poor people to access that I suspect it saved a lot more lives than it's hurt. Um, uh, but in this current world, where particularly with environmental laws, um, that's insufficient. And if people are gonna move half a billion dollars away from one group to another person, um, you'll find we'll start managing that and people might start stop using it. 
Um, I'm not seeing it at the moment. I'm, it still seems to be the predominant one used by people who want to kill weeds. There's a lot of very safe, holistic, biodynamic, organic weed killers, but they don't work. Um, at least they don't work effectively. So I think we've got to watch this space. I'm certainly monitoring a lot more workers now since that, uh, that big decision. Um, yeah, we've probably got another webinar in a couple of months' time where the AVPMA is going to talk about the Australian perspective on um, glyphosate. So it's a very topical issue. Um, thank you very much, Rob. Does anyone else have any questions? I do. Lisa, Lisa <laughs> has a question. Then Adrian has his hands up as well. Sorry, Lisa. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. Look, look, my, my, mine's more more a comment. So perhaps Lisa, let let you ask the question first. Hey, oh, thanks, Adrian. I was actually going to change track here a little bit and and ask Rob about something that's very topical at the moment, which is COVID nineteen, and particularly potential of um, health surveillance and environmental surveillance. Um, at the workplace level, we, we know that, um, particularly in Victoria, and another, I believe in another, other states, they are testing um, effluent um, at certain points to get an understanding of, of the prevalence of the virus in, in the sewerage. Is this something that is potentially going to happen, that we're going to see probably more and more testing at the workplaces for not only just monitoring employees, temperature checks, etc., but actually doing more in-depth um, environmental monitoring? Yes, it's technically not health surveillance. It's actually uh, trying to find cases of disease, um, but it's you know, no doubt it's topical. In fact, the last meeting I was in was a major supermarket chain and we, my contribution was should we be contributing to the testing program because the Victorian government wants us to? And if so, how are we gonna do it? And what are the problems? Um, what do I think? Look, I think there's, you gotta be really careful about doing tests. There's an old thing in medicine, don't do tests unless you know what you're gonna do with the result. Um, and half the time, and if you know what the result's gonna be, because if you're doing a test and you have no real plan on what to do with the result, it causes all sorts of problems. I can't see much reason at the moment for employers to test, um, particularly the asymptomatic population. Certainly if someone's got symptoms, they should be sent for testing and even then the employer shouldn't do it because the government's able to do it. But to test your population, your working population for no reason, there will be significant problems with that. Um, and uh, a careful SWOT analysis would be required before an employer decides to do it. Um, having said that, there are, you know, employers, large companies are, a, you know, they, they're good corporate citizens. They want to contribute to the overall well-being of the community, and maybe they can contribute to the funding of testing of masses of population, which is a public health issue, not an occupational health issue. At this point in time, from an occupational health issue, I think there are only very rare circumstances where an employer might decide to test its asymptomatic workforce. Um, COVID-19, of course, is just a new recent biological hazard. We've got other viruses that we're worried about, hepatitis A and hepatitis B in the workplace. Um, we don't go randomly testing for those either. Um, influenza is obviously can be a work spread virus. Then we've got bacteria, and I've already mentioned a few. We've got rickettsial type organisms. We don't go around measuring those in people. We just don't do it. If someone becomes crook and we think it's an exposure, we'll mess, test them, but you don't randomly test people for to see if they've got flu. You don't randomly test people to see if they've got Q fever. We do tests when people become unwell. In a pandemic like this, there may be some utility in testing the asymptomatic population, but that's a public health issue, not an occupational health issue. It's just interesting that we've got um as you say, there's there's a lot of viruses out there. There's there's bacteria, etc. But we now have our workplace um, health and safety regulators getting involved in in things like reporting, and that if there's cases, we have to report to 
um, in Victoria and, and other states as well into the, to the work health and safety regulators. And, but yet, as you say, other, other bacteria and inf viruses, etc. we don't seem to be doing that. We've, we've sort of pounced on this. Yeah. You have to report Q fever. You have to report Legionnaire's disease. Um, trying to think. You have to report if you've got a work contracted hepatitis. You would. Um, I suspect I'd have to check on. Yeah, you would. Hepatitis B and hepatitis A are both notifiable. So there are other biological hazards, organisms that if the person gets the disease, we are compelled to notify. What we don't have to do is go around testing the ACE world population but nobody has to do that yet with COVID-19. Sorry go on. So I guess the, the issue is is that while those others are, are notifiable to the depa relevant departments of health we are now having as health and safety people to report incidents of corona, um, coronavirus to our workplace regulators. Correct. So that's a bit of a shift where, yes, there's the other diseases are reported to the departments of health. They go through their contract, um, contact tracing and obviously do with it via their protocols. But we're now having um, to report an incidence to our WorkSafe regulators, which is That's right. If you're made aware that one of your workers has got the disease, you would have to notify public health. That's a specific piece of legislation that kicks in if we deem it a pandemic or an, an emergency. That legislation doesn't exist until we kick in that legislation. So soon in our state, for example, they might stop saying we're in a, that particular pandemic when there's no community transmission, then you don't have to. So that's a yeah, that's an unusual piece of legislative shift that actually overrides even the, say the premiers and the, uh, the capability. Because when these things happen, the public health department actually get all these new authorities, um, but they are short usually for the duration of a pandemic. But you're quite right, it is unusual because new legislation, it's not new legislation, it's been there. Long-standing legislation that we rarely have seen before is suddenly enacted now, which is unusual. Thank you. Adrian, do you have a question? Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's actually more of a comment, and I, I hope it's of interest to uh, to, to Rob, uh, Robert, that um, uh, effectively I was involved in a project about 10, 15 years ago with respect to lead. And what was happening was that uh, we were actually um, involved in, if you like, cleaning up the, 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 the sandstone surface of one of the um, cathedrals in Melbourne. And uh, suddenly... All of the plumbers, who, who I think, I guess they routinely get tested, is it once a, once a month or once every three months or whatever for lead, lead uh, uh, poisoning, uh, they, 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 they were called off site. And the, the people in charge, they got really worried and they said, what, what's going on? So we had a look at the, we thought maybe the lead had come from the, um, uh, from, from the sandstone. In other words, it was tetraethyl lead had deposited on it, it, you know deposited on the sandstone we were then taking the sand we were then cleaning the sandstone off and in that process had, had we exposed the plumbers and everybody else to, to uh, you know quite high levels of lead and uh, we had a look at that no nothing there and then I said to them I said look hang on I remember a conversation I had with a with a, uh, a botanist 30 years ago and he said there was a very high concentration of lead because of tetraethyl lead in, in gasoline uh, when you get close to close to nature strips. And I said, have any of your people been touching any foliage? And they said, well, they, they said they had been taking, you know, working on the lead, lead sheeting. I said, yeah, but what else did they touch? And they said, well, we actually touched the, um, the, the lichen. And I said, I think that's your problem. And once they sort, once they sorted that out, everything everything fell into place. So, like I say, it's a comment, but it just shows it's not always where you think it is. Oh, very interesting. Um, I can match that with a one case. I was looking after a lead mine, which had very low lead exposure, except when you're in the mill, because um, the rest it just wasn't in the air and they didn't need it. 
And I had one guy who kept being high and, and then he got to start looking for non-occupational exposures because I just couldn't see, but didn't do anything. I couldn't find anything. He was a fisherman because he's in Tasmania and they all fish and mm. hunt, but doesn't make his own sinkers, doesn't make his own shotgun pellets. I just couldn't find anything. He wasn't renovating houses with lead, but just continually elevated to the point where we had to keep removing him from the workplace, even though the workplace was in, didn't seem to have that much lead. And then uh, one day he came to me and said, could it be when I'm out fishing and standing in the water, just because I'm bored, I suck on sinkers all day long? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that could be it. <laughs> you forgot to mention that to me in all that time. So now I always ask people, are you a fisher person and do you suck on your sinkers? Because apparently some people just like it rolling around in their mouth um, and it must have a metallic taste that they like and they just fiddle with it. Um, and so, uh, yes, he was, he there, was you, there you go. <laughs> okay. Thank um, you. One more question, Rob. Um, could you send me your slides so that I can email them out to people? No problems at all, but you've probably got to go to the person who helped organize this and ask them. Um, cause I just, I'm just the person they wheel out. Um, someone's better than me knows where they all are, but if you shoot an email to whoever organized this, they absolutely would send them to you. Thank you very much. Um, any more questions, guys? No, that, thank you very much, Rob. That's really appreciated.